Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Paul, and in this Gaming to the Com video, we could be discussing and analysing tech news, which, as usual, has popped up over the past 24 or so hours. We're going to be starting things out with the PlayStation Vita 2, or whatever you want to call it. That's right, there are rumours that Sony are working on a next-generation portable device, so we're going to discuss exactly what shape that that could come in, along with the rumour itself, and then we're going to move over to Intel and the 8-core 16 thread coffee lake processor as well as the z390 platform that's right a series of leaks over the last day or so gives us a lot more details on how this processor will shape up along with the feature set of the z390 platform itself normal thing if you do enjoy this video please feel free to subscribe to the channel and of course click like on the video now starting things out with sony the PlayStation Vita debuted way back in the closing days of 2011. It was the 17th of December 2011 to be specific. Which means by the end of this year, the console will essentially be a grandfather. And over the past few months, there have been a lot of news stories, which obviously shows us that the PlayStation Vita is nearing the end of its life. For a start, Sony has reported the ending production of physical PlayStation Vita games. Sales figures for the console are a little difficult to come by. Sony have been somewhat reluctant to share them. But it did sell rather well in Japan. The research firm, uh, firm Ida, uh, by the end of 2015, believed that the sales figures of the Vita were around the 10 million mark, and another source, Glixel, believes that they're around 15 million. So let's take the latter number, 15 million. If you want some level of context, the 3DS which also launched in 2011, however it was significantly earlier, it was around the February-March time, depending on the part of the world, it managed to sell over 72 million units, which is obviously a significant difference in performance between, between the two systems. But that doesn't necessarily mean that Sony are done with the system. The president and CEO of Sony Interactive Entertainment, his name is John Codiri. Uh, by the way, just for your FYI, he of course replaced Andrew House back in October of last year, was part of a roundtable interview which was uh, captured by the folks over at Bloomberg. He said that rather than believing that separate uh, portable gaming systems need to be kept in mind for, let's say, portable gaming or a physical console, he believes that it's best to think of portable gaming as just one method to deliver more gaming experiences and exploring what customers want from a portable. You may scratch your head there and say, hmm, that sounds very Switch-like, and my friends, you're probably quite right. We'll get to that in just a second, but remember that rumours of the PlayStation 5 are already around, and it's without question that the PS5 is almost certain, at least in the eyes of many analysts, including myself, that it will indeed be using an x86-based processor. Of course, we've all heard the rumours it's going to most likely be using Zen-based system. If you need to, you can search PlayStation 5 Zen on the, the search box on the channel for a lot more insight into that. So what does that leave us with the next generation of PlayStation Portable? Well, back in March of 2017, there were actually a series of patent design applications that were leaked online. This was via a Japanese website, Asitiro, hopefully I'm pronouncing that correctly. And you can see that yes, it does look somewhat Switch-like. Of course, you can see that yes, it does have a couple of analog sticks. You've got the all too familiar square, triangle, X and circle buttons, and of course a D-pad. The peculiar shape looks very much like a slightly altered um, DualShock 4 controller, albeit cut in the sections with the handle and then a screen placed in the middle. Personally, I wouldn't be surprised if Sony did actually explore this. I mean, it's not like the V2 was a terrible failure or anything. It did pretty well. And the PlayStation Portable before it did pretty well also. Admittedly, from Sony's point of view, the rampant piracy on the system probably hurt the console in the long run, but still, Sony are most likely going to be doubling down on it, at least in my opinion. How this actually functions in reality, well, there's an awful lot of ideas. The first is that it could certainly leverage cloud-based gaming. A second theory is that it could, at least in theory, 
connect more to the PlayStation 5. Therefore, for example, let's say that you're in room A of your house and the PlayStation 5 is in a different room, it could probably stream whatever you're playing on the system to that and possibly also play local games as well. Or perhaps even transmit whatever cloud-based title over its own 5G or 4G connection, although I'm somewhat dubious about that, or perhaps even connect via Wi-Fi to whatever uh, network is around and possibly even stream from your PlayStation 5 in your, in your living room to you. Of course, all these are just different theories. I would be rather shocked, however, if we're looking at a system that would have anywhere close to the PS 4's level of performance, there's a numerous reasons for that. If you were to take a look at, let's say, the amount of performance that a handheld normally puts out, it usually operates within about the 10 to 15 watts of power region. Even if we were to see the APU of the PS4 shrunk down to a 7nm process with all of the GPU parts and the CPU and blah blah blah, it's most likely it's going to be at least double that. So I don't think we're going to just simply see a PS4 uh, turned into a handheld or anything. And obviously if they were to somehow just cut down the amount of compute units inside the uh, PlayStation Portable 2 or whatever it's end up being called. And of course they were to reduce the number of CPU cores or possibly downclock the processor as well. Games themselves would require a patch to operate after all. Otherwise your game code would literally be addressing a CPU thread or a you know GPU section which was quite literally not even in the system. Nevertheless, at least in my opinion, the marketplace could certainly do with a new system. I think it's fair to say that the 3DS now is pretty long in the tooth. It is pretty cheap, which does help, and obviously parents are mo much more likely to buy, let's say, a 3DS for a younger kid, because, well, if you lose a 3DS, you're not going to be quite as uh, perturbed, upset, as if you were to lose, let's say, a brand spanking new Nintendo Switch. So I'll pass the question off to you. Would you buy a new PlayStation Portable? Are you happy, however, just to use your cell phone or your Switch or whatever? In fact, if you own a Switch, I'm curious, how many of you even use it exclusively in the docked mode? I will admit I use my Switch occasionally for Portable, but pretty much only for very long journeys, like plane journeys. Otherwise, I just don't bother, to be honest. I'll just watch something on my cell phone or do whatever. So we have a two-part update for Intel. The first is feature sets of the Z390 were accidentally placed on Intel's official website. They have since been removed and we also have further interest when it comes to the 8 core 16 thread CPU and a lot more information regarding that. I'm going to start things out with the chipset itself. There are a couple of major changes to the chipset feature table. The first of which is it does indeed have an integrated Intel wireless AC support. Uh, this is something that the Z370 does not have baked in. Of course, you can certainly get wireless devices uh, built right into the motherboard, but it isn't part of the actual chipset. The other difference is that we see the inclusion of USB 3.1 port Gen 2. Previously, they did not have that on the 370s. Instead, you had zero USB Gen 2s, but you had 10 uh, Gen 1s, but now it's a 6 and a 10 configuration, 6 for Gen 2 and 10 for Gen 1. If you were to actually look at the Z370 chipset, it's not that different from the Z270 motherboard. In fact, if you were to actually look at the Flex IO lane specifications, they're essentially mirrored between the two. The Z390 does change things up a little bit. However, to be abundantly clear, the number of lanes are identical. What is rather interesting to me is that we're so close to Computex right now. So the fact that this did pop up on Intel's website clo so close to Computex may mean that they are looking to actually reveal this around that date instead. Don't forget that the previous embargo date, from what we'd heard, was going to be around September of this year. So it's possible that AMD, just simply because of the 
2700X doing rather well and AMD doing fairly well in CPU sales as a whole, maybe Intel feel the pressure and possibly that's helping them push forward. Another possibility is it may have absolutely zero to do with AMD and perhaps Intel are shock and horror ahead of schedule for once and they just feel that, yeah, you know what, we feel confident enough now to show this product of Computex because we don't feel like it's going to catch fire. In fact, this may actually be further demonstrated with the fact that on their own web page, once again before it was pulled down, they actually had a test plan slash procedures describing the quote, test suite and procedures used to perform validation and perform environment thermal qualifications, emissions, reliability, compatibility, or performance testing. Rev 1, revision 1 obviously, added two new coffee, uh, sorry, two new eight core S. Uh, SKUs, SKUs if you prefer, Coffee Lake S, 8 core, 95 watt, and 80 watt. So I'm just going to repeat that one more time. So we have an 8 core, 95 watt, and 80 watt part as well, and updated other 6 core, 4 core SKU limits. And before we discuss that, let's further add some evidence that Intel are getting closer and closer to having a well, let's say more reliable retail sample chip, and that is yet another leak on Sysoft Sandra. This is once again listing a genuine Intel CPU, 0000, hint, engineering sample, hint, 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 at 3.1 gigahertz. Now, previously, the engineering sample we saw was, I believe, at 2.6 gigahertz, so we're looking at 500 megahertz improvement there. And the date for this was the 24th of May, so only yesterday. All other details are exactly what you would expect. 16 megabytes of level 3 cache, 256 kilobytes of level 2 cache per core, so of course that's 8 times 256. 8 cores, 16 threads. By, boli, uh, by golly gosh, excuse me, you've got the performance metrics there, so you can start working those out if you so desire. But of course, at the moment, it's still, well you know, early engineering samples. And before you get really excited and start dancing with joy at the fact it says KB Lake platform, I'm going to probably say that there's about as much chance of the uh, 8 core 16 thread Coffee Lake X processors working in a Z270 motherboard, for example, as what there would be, say, Batman forgetting to put on his bat suit. In other words, very bloody little. If you were to take a look at the annuals of history, Intel typically does keep their chips, for the mainstream anyway, at around the 90 to 95 watts. Most of the time it's 95 watts. Some of them have, of course, been 91 watts. But we're arguing semantics, so the fact of the matter is it's going to remain at that power level. The reason that's rather interesting is I do wonder how much voltage and heat these things are going to put out, at least if you were to compare it apples for apples against, let's say, the 8700K. So, and this is a pure thought process, this is not uh, necessarily related to the news, but I do wonder, uh, just in terms of power consumption, how we would see these processes perform. Let's say if they were both running at 4 gigahertz, let's assume that these processes get to a nice 4 gigahertz, so you have the 8700K locked at 4 gigahertz, this locked at 4 gigahertz. I'm just curious what the heat and power consumption differences would be there, just for a bit of an experiment. Regardless, it's really clock speed that is going to make or break these processes, and of course the pricing as well. And I know I've said this like a dozen times now, but it really does come down to that. It's like, yeah, if this runs at, let's say, 4.7, 4.8 gigahertz, 4.5 gigahertz even, that's great, but Obviously, if it's like two to three hundred bucks more expensive than the 2700X, and from the rumors, AMD are getting pretty good mileage out of their yields, although obviously they're not going to say, well, this number out of a thousand processes is failing or not meeting the yield, uh, you know, that we're expecting. So, you know, we're just kind of guessing there. But AMD probably have it in them to drop the price a little bit if they wanted to be super duper ultra aggressive. And of course, we have seen them do that with the, you know, the 1700s, the 1700Xs, and of course, even Threadripper, we saw some price cuts there. So possibly AMD are going to do that and then release the 2800X that we've heard very little about other than AMD saying, yeah, we've, we might release it, but 
just to remind everyone my thoughts on that it's not like we're going to see like another two processor cores added to it and it's not like we're going to see like additional cache or anything like that it's instead just going to be a clock speed bump most likely and how much more room amd have got left in the in the 2000 series tank when it comes to clock speed i don't know i, I don't necessarily feel confident that they could take the clock speed crown but that may not necessarily be the point if they cherry pick the silicon really well, and if they, for example, manage to get, let's say, two to three hundred megahertz on top of the twenty-seven hundred X, with only a small price premium, then it may at least eat some of Intel's sales up. With all of that said, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on the take on this situation. What do you think? If the eight core sixteen thread processor turns out to be pretty darn sweet, would you upgrade? Let's say if you've got an 8700K, would you be interested? Would you do it if you've got uh, backwards compatibility with, let's say, the Z370 platform so you wouldn't need to change your motherboard? What would it take for you to upgrade? Or would you not really care and you just stick with what you've got? With all of that said, hopefully you've enjoyed the video. Normal stuff, like, share, give me hugs, and, you know, subscribe. With that said, take care of yourselves. Bye for now.